Welcome to another episode of the Red Cell series. Here we shall discuss the structure, synthesis and function of haemoglobin and how we can use this to understand anemias and other red cell pathologies. This video might be a little long, but hopefully afterwards you'll have a firm understanding of haemoglobin and hopefully save you a lot of time going through countless resources. So let's get started. We can divide the word haemoglobin into two words, heme and globin. The heme part is made up of iron and protoporphyrin, and we shall see shortly how these two combine to form heme. The globin part is a polypeptide chain that comes in various forms, forming different types of haemoglobin, and again, shortly, we shall discuss the different types of haemoglobin. So if we draw this out, we'll start off with the protoporphyrin rings. I won't go into the detailed chemistry here as it's not relevant to this series, but generally the ring is composed of four rings, each with a nitrogen atom and four carbon atoms, and these are all joined together. This here is known as a skeletal structure. I didn't draw every carbon atom, but all we need to know is that this is a protoporphyrin ring. In the middle of the protoporphyrin ring, we have the ferrous iron, Fe2+, and this is what binds and carries oxygen in circulation. Next, we have the globins. These are made up of four subunits. There are three main types of normal haemoglobin, including fetal haemoglobin, or HBF, which has two alpha and two gamma globin chains, adult haemoglobin, or HBA, which has two alpha and two beta globin chains, and normal variant adult haemoglobin, or HBA2, which has two delta and two gamma globin chains. So let us draw HBA. I'll simply draw one large box and divide it into four subunits rather than having a convoluted diagram that's difficult to understand. So that's two alpha and two beta. And each globin contains a heme, so it contains a protoporphyrin ring and iron in the middle. So this here is the basic structure of haemoglobin. Keep this in the back of your mind that haemoglobin is composed of iron and protoporphyrin, which make up heme, and polypeptide globin chains. It will come in very handy once we discuss anemia. So the iron here binds oxygen for transport, and the haemoglobin is now said to be oxygenated. So when the oxygen binds to haemoglobin, it's known as oxyhemoglobin or oxygenated haemoglobin. Okay, so on to haemoglobin synthesis. Now, we don't need to know too much about this. Um, if you are interested, I have included a reference. We shall discuss briefly how haemoglobin is synthesized, but we won't go into the detailed biochemical pathways. But we shall go into enough detail so you can appreciate the pathologies that arise from haemoglobin. So haemoglobin synthesis occurs within the mitochondria of developing red blood cells. And remember that red blood cells develop in the bone marrow through hematopoiesis and erythropoiesis. So let us start with protoporphyrin. There are many reactions that take place during the synthesis of protoporphyrin within the mitochondria. We won't cover them all. We don't really need to know about them. We just need to know about one very important step, and that is the rate limiting step. So this step involves the conversion of glycine and succinic acid to amino levulinic acid via amino levulinic acid synthase. Many reactions later, this forms protoporphyrin. The reason why this reaction is very important is because it requires a cofactor known as vitamin B6. You will appreciate why vitamin B6 is very important once we discuss the anemias, as vitamin B6 is one of the causes of an anemia known as sideroblastic anemia, but don't worry too much about that just yet. Let us now discuss how protoporphyrin gets its iron to form heme, and how heme binds to globin to form hemoglobin. This is easier to describe using a diagram, so we shall do that. 
We will discuss the physiology of iron in the next video, so if you get confused at all, don't worry. Um, I will describe the key points here as well. So let's get started. So the iron inside the blood is bound to a molecule known as transferrin. So transferrin is a carrier molecule inside the blood and it carries two atoms of iron. The iron bound to transferrin then binds to transferrin receptors on developing red blood cells. It can bind to a transferrin receptor on other cells, but in this case, it binds to a transferrin receptor on a red blood cell. Now this here is then internalized. So now we have the receptor with the transferrin, with the iron, all inside the cell. Once inside the cell, this is recycled. So the transferrin receptor is recycled back onto the surface of the red blood cell so that it can take in some more iron and the transferrin molecule is pumped out into circulation where it can pick up some more iron. The iron inside the cell can be stored as ferritin. So ferritin is one of the stores of iron. We'll discuss this in detail in the next video. Or the iron can go towards the mitochondria. So this here is the mitochondria. And through the action of ferrochelatase binds to protoporphyrin to form heme. So now we have heme. The nucleus, which is here, then gives instructions to produce globin chains from amino acids. The globin chains, for example, alpha and beta, bind to the heme that is released from the mitochondria to form hemoglobin. And now we have hemoglobin inside the red blood cell. And this whole process continues again and again until the red blood cell is packed full of hemoglobin. And gradually through the process of hematopoiesis and erythropoiesis, the red blood cells lose their nuclei as well as other organelles and become packed full of hemoglobin. Let us now discuss the different types of hemoglobin. The variability is within the globin chains. Remember we said that hemoglobin, Hb, is composed of heme plus globin. And the heme component is composed of iron, so Fe, and protoporphyrin rings. Whereas the globin component is composed of amino acid polypeptide chains. So here again, the globin and the variability of the amino acid polypeptide chains is what determines which type of hemoglobin we have. So let us start with fetal hemoglobin. This is the first hemoglobin that we produce once we are in fetal life. So fetal hemoglobin, abbreviated HBF, has two alpha and two gamma globin chains. So if you were to write this, you would write two alpha and two gamma. It is produced by the erythroid precursor cells from 10 to 12 weeks of gestation and very importantly it continues to be produced and continues to be present in circulation through the first six months postnatally so that is the first six months of life. Now this is very important clinically once we discuss the different pathologies of hemoglobin in the anemia series, you'll come to appreciate why symptoms appear when they do and what we can do about it. Now, fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen at all oxygen partial pressures compared to other hemoglobin. Affinity here means the degree of binding, so the degree at which oxygen binds to the hemoglobin. Now this is very important because it ensures that oxygen is transferred to the fetus from the maternal blood via the placenta. So let's say here we have the maternal blood, so maternal blood, and then we have the placenta, and then we have the baby. The partial pressure of oxygen here can vary. This really depends on the situation and the circumstance, but that's not our focus here. The main point here is that fetal hemoglobin, so HBF, can come towards the placenta and take as much oxygen as possible and deliver that to the baby, regardless of the partial pressure. So again, fetal hemoglobin goes to the placenta, 
takes up the oxygen regardless of the partial pressure even though the partial pressure is low it has a higher affinity so it binds to as much oxygen as possible regardless of the partial pressure and delivers that to the baby the fetal hemoglobin is also capable of unloading the oxygen regardless if there is a high pressure or a low pressure so in this case it means that the oxygen is delivered to the tissues so oxygen is delivered to the tissues and this is very beautiful it really describes one of the main characteristics of fetal hemoglobin so fetal hemoglobin goes to the placenta takes up the oxygen regardless of the partial pressure and delivers that to the baby again regardless of the partial pressure and this is one of the key characteristics of fetal hemoglobin so if we draw a graph we can appreciate this a little more so what we have here on the x-axis is the age, so gestational life, zero to nine months, then birth, and then zero to three, six, nine months postnatally, which is life. On the y-axis, we have the concentration of hemoglobin type given as a percentage. So we'll plot other hemoglobins here as well. So if we consider fetal hemoglobin, remember we said it starts around 10 to 12 weeks, increases beginning to plateau around six nine months and then begins to decline until it comes to a halt so this curve here shows that it increases through fetal life so through gestation once we hit birth it does begin to decline but it's still present in fetal circulation and still is being produced although another type of hemoglobin called hemoglobin A is being produced that takes over as we shall see shortly. Another graph that we can draw is the partial pressure for oxygen in KPA on the x-axis and the saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen on the y-axis and we can use this graph to compare the affinity of different types of hemoglobin. So if we were to draw fetal hemoglobin here it will look something like this and this is known as a sigmoid curve. This graph here is known as the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. We'll talk a little later about this curve once we discuss the function of hemoglobin. Another type of normal hemoglobin is adult hemoglobin, abbreviated as HbA. Now this here contains two alpha and two beta globin chains. So that's written as two alpha and two beta beta. Now this is the most common hemoglobin found in the blood. Just to refresh our memories, remember we said that each hemoglobin has four subunits, so in this case it will be two alpha and two beta. And we drew a big box, so this is the big box here. And then we divided this into four, so these are four subunits. And we said that each of these subunits, so each of these small boxes is a subunit, contains a protoporphyrin ring with iron in the middle. So again here, protoporphyrin with iron, protoporphyrin with iron, protoporphyrin with iron. This here is hemoglobin. These individual boxes are the subunits. Now, if you check on Google, you'll probably see these rather convoluted pictures and diagrams of hemoglobin. And that's probably a more accurate illustration of the structure of hemoglobin. But what we are trying to show here is a simple illustration of the four subunits. So one, two, three, four of the four subunits of hemoglobin. So this whole structure is hemoglobin, each with its own protoporphyrin ring and iron in the middle. A normal variant of adult hemoglobin is adult hemoglobin 2, abbreviated HbA2. This here has two alpha and two delta globin chains. So two alpha, two delta globin chains. So rather than having two beta chains, it has two delta chains. So these here would be delta rather than beta. This is present in very low levels in the blood. It's rather insignificant compared to the HbA. However, it might increase with a condition known as beta thalassemia. This is a type of microcytic anemia. If you have no idea what this is, don't worry. We'll cover this in detail in the anemia series. So let's plot HbA on our graph. This probably starts around five, six months. There is a lot of studies investigating when it's produced, etc. But that's not relevant to this talk right now. So it starts around five, six months, gradually increases and then takes over.
So what we see here is that while fetal hemoglobin has plateaued to its maximum, adult hemoglobin is being produced and this gradually increases until we reach birth. At birth, adult hemoglobin takes over. Fetal hemoglobin is in decline, but it is still present and still being produced. And there is a switch over from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin. And this process tends to finish around six to seven months postnatally when there is no more fetal hemoglobin left in circulation. And now the adult hemoglobin continues to be synthesized for the rest of the person's life. Now there is a pathology known as the thalassemias, which is a type of anemia that affects the globin component of hemoglobin. Um, but don't worry about that just yet, we'll cover this in detail in the anemia series. Now adult hemoglobin has a lower affinity for oxygen compared to fetal hemoglobin. And so the curve will be shifted towards the right and to look something like this, where the affinity of fetal hemoglobin is higher compared to that of adult hemoglobin. Just to help you appreciate the difference in affinity between the fetal hemoglobin and the adult hemoglobin, let us consider some data. So let's take, for example, a partial pressure for oxygen as five. And if we look at the adult hemoglobin first, so let's draw a line towards the adult hemoglobin and then read the y-axis, which is the percentage saturation of hemoglobin, and label this A. And compare this to fetal hemoglobin. So again, we have a partial pressure of 5, and we go towards the fetal hemoglobin curve and read the y-axis. So let's say this is B. So again, the y-axis is the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. What we can see here clearly is that A is less than B or the affinity of adult hemoglobin for oxygen is less than that of fetal hemoglobin. So let us now discuss the function of hemoglobin. So remember in the last video, we said that the main physiological role of red blood cells is the transport of gases, so oxygen and carbon dioxide, and they play a role in the maintenance of systemic acid-base equilibrium. So we'll start with oxygen. Now hemoglobin plays a very important role here. The iron in hemoglobin binds to oxygen in the lungs and delivers this to the tissue. If you remember the structure of protoporphyrin, remember that hemoglobin, again Hb is heme plus globin and the heme is composed of iron and protoporphyrin. So this here is heme and heme has an iron atom in the middle. This can bind to oxygen, so O2. If we were to draw this to include all four subunits of hemoglobin, you would have one, two, three, four heme groups, each with an attached oxygen. So you can divide this again into the four subunits of globin, each with the heme in the middle. So this here now is known as oxyhemoglobin or oxygenated hemoglobin because oxygen is bound to the iron atoms. It doesn't matter which term you use, oxygenated hemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin both mean the same thing. So let us discuss the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. We've previously touched on the affinity of oxygen when we discussed the differences between fetal and adult hemoglobin but let's look at this a bit more closely. Now we will also discuss this in detail in the respiratory medicine series. So oxygen rapidly and reversibly binds to hemoglobin, forming oxyhemoglobin. The oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve shows us how much oxygen can bind to the hemoglobin at a given partial pressure of oxygen. So in other words, it describes the affinity, the degree of binding of oxygen to hemoglobin at any given partial pressure of oxygen. So let's take a closer look. This is the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. On the x-axis, we have the partial pressure of oxygen. So this is the amount of oxygen dissolved in the blood. It is measured as kilopascals in the UK and millimeters of mercury in the US. On the y-axis, we have how much hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. 
and this is given as a percentage and as we can see and we've seen before what we have here is a nice sigmoid curve we've mentioned previously that this sigmoid curve illustrates the change in affinity of hemoglobin so binding of a single oxygen molecule increases the binding of another oxygen molecule the change in affinity is very important because it facilitates the loading of oxygen in the lungs and the unloading of oxygen at tissues let's see from the graph how this varies so if we consider the maximum partial pressure and read this off the graph we note that we have a hundred percent saturation and this here is the arterial blood arterial blood at 75 percent saturation if we read this off the graph we get a value of about 40 millimeters of mercury and this here is more reflective of venous blood now if hemoglobin is 50 percent saturated so this means that on average two of the four heme groups on each hemoglobin molecule is bound to oxygen we get a partial pressure reading of 3.4 kilopascals or 25 millimeters of mercury and this here is known as the p50 which again means that on average two out of four heme groups on each hemoglobin molecule is bound to oxygen so we can really see the difference between arterial blood and venous blood so when you are seeing a patient you might be asked to interpret their blood gases a blood gas is when you take blood from a patient and run it in a blood gas analyzer so it looks at different gases and different parts of the blood the reference ranges for normal arterial and venous blood gases are different arterial oxygen is usually 10.6 to 13.3 kilopascals or 75 to 100 millimeters of mercury whereas venous blood gas is usually 4 to 5.3 kilopascals or 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury and it is very important to differentiate whether you are testing for arterial blood or venous blood the affinity of oxygen is highest in the arterial blood so this is the lung and as you pass through circulation the affinity decreases so that it unloads the oxygen molecules to the tissues let us quickly talk about the changes that can occur to the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve now this depends on three factors these are the three factors and these three factors can affect the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen so these are ph temperature and a molecule known as 2,3 dpg which we shall discuss shortly now a right shift occurs when there is decreased affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen so what we have here is the right shift so here is normal and this has shifted towards the right so again this is due to decreased affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen now this here occurs in the tissue and what we see is an increased p50 so if you look here the p50 value has increased so p50 again is when two out of the four hemes are saturated with oxygen so 50 percent saturation of oxygen has increased so this is normal about 3.3 kpa and this is increased about 5 kpa and what this means is that unloading of oxygen is facilitated so more oxygen is coming off the hemoglobin and given to the tissue so let us look at the three factors we'll start off with the ph so increased carbon dioxide decreases ph and this is very important you'll come to appreciate this again and again increased carbon dioxide decreases ph and this causes something called the bohr effect where the increased carbon dioxide decreases affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen so this here is very important increased carbon dioxide decreases affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen thus facilitating the unloading of oxygen 
in tissues. So more oxygen is released into the tissues when there is increased carbon dioxide in the area. An example of this is exercise. When we exercise, we produce more carbon dioxide, thus lowering the pH, and this stimulates oxygen delivery to the muscle. The second factor is increased temperature, and again, exercise is a big factor here. The third factor is 2,3-DPG, and an increased 2,3-DPG causes a right shift. So what is 2,3-DPG? This is a molecule that binds to the beta globins of deoxyhemoglobin, so of hemoglobin without oxygen, thus decreasing the binding affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. So less oxygen binds to the hemoglobin when 2,3-DPG is bound to the beta globins of hemoglobin. Now this can occur in people that live at high altitude where they synthesize more 2,3-DPG allowing for more oxygen to unload into the tissues that need it. And this is a phenomenon known as adaptation of chronic hypoxemia. Now we can also get a left shift. So this here is the normal curve and it has shifted towards the left. This is due to an increased affinity. So the affinity has increased, so more oxygen is binding to the hemoglobin. And this occurs in the lungs. The P50 is decreased. As we can see here, the P50 is decreased compared to the p50 of a normal curve thus the unloading of oxygen is difficult in these conditions so let us discuss the same factors a low carbon dioxide causes a left shift so this is the opposite of a right shift also a low temperature and a low 2,3 dpg remember that 2,3 dpg binds to beta globins and prevents oxygen binding allowing oxygen to unload. Two other factors that cause a left shift include fetal hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin cannot bind to 2,3-DBG because it lacks the binding sites, leaving more spaces for oxygen to bind. So this is very important, and this is one of the characteristics of fetal hemoglobin. Also, we have carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide competes with oxygen for hemoglobin binding. The affinity of hemoglobin for carbon monoxide is 200 times of that for oxygen. So what this results in is a decreased oxygen percentage hemoglobin saturation. The reason why this causes a left shift is because binding of carbon monoxide to hemoglobin increases the affinity of the remaining sites for oxygen, thus causing a left shift. So let's look at the graph. What we see here in green is carbon monoxide poisoning. What we can appreciate immediately is that this line, this line here, is significantly lower. This shows that hemoglobin saturation is significantly lower for oxygen compared to the normal graph. So more sites are occupied by carbon monoxide compared to oxygen. So regardless of the partial pressure of oxygen, saturation cannot exceed this point again because it is occupied by carbon monoxide. So again, less oxygen is binding to the hemoglobin. And this left shift is due to the increased affinity. Remember, carbon monoxide increases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. The hemoglobin wants the oxygen, but it can't bind it because it's saturated with carbon monoxide. Moving on to carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide is transported in three forms. It can be free, so dissolved in the blood. It can be bound to hemoglobin, forming carbaminohemoglobin or it can be converted into bicarbonate within the red blood cells. This is HCO3-. And we will discuss this in detail in our respiratory series. Now, the first two forms account for 10%, whereas the conversion of carbon dioxide to bicarbonate accounts for 90%. And this really reflects on how red blood cells are involved in maintaining acid-base equilibrium. But again, we shall discuss this in our respiratory series. Please like, subscribe and share our content with your friends and on social media pages. Our mission is to develop need to know video content and question banks that remain free for your use. We are unable to keep doing this without your support. Thank you.